Okay, so in the last section we took a look at how to display categorical data. In this section we're going to take a look at displaying data, quantitative data. There will be two videos for this section um, broken down into two, so the first video will be the first half and the second video will be the second half. Alright, so specifically we're going to dis look at how we can display quantitative data with graphs, how these graphs are different from categorical data. At the end of this, you should be able to construct and interpret dot plots, stem plots, and histograms, which is what we will be doing for most of statistics. So in most of statistics, we will be taking a look at quantitative data over categorical data. So sort of from now on, you can kind of think about, um, don't throw out your knowledge of categorical data, be able to understand the difference between the two, but this is the major building block for what you're going to be doing for the rest of the year. Okay, um, You're going to be able to describe the shape of a histogram, that's going to have some specific instructions, compare histograms, and how can we make sure that we correctly use a histogram. All right, so categorical data, remember we used bar charts, remember how this is different from a histogram, um, they, the bars don't touch each other, there's a little bit of space in between, so if there is a space in between, it doesn't mean that that's a value of zero, it just means that there's an actual space, um, and we took a look at pie graphs, so those were our two major ways to display categorical data. In this section, we're going to say, how can we display quantitative data? One of the major ways that we have displayed in statistics is through a dot plot. So notice with the dot plot, um, the types of snakes, and this is a count. There are four types of black cobras, five types of pythons, two anacondas, a bunch of rattlesnakes. So it gives a count within each category. Um, we use histograms, and with the histogram, just please make sure that you understand that the bars all must be touching each other. Okay, they're not, there's no separation space. If there is a separation space in a histogram, that means the value is zero. A stem plot, so think, oh geez, you've been making stem plots since what, like third grade or something? <laughs> um, and box plots, which I don't have a picture on here, but remember your box and whisker plots that you were sh weren't sure what you'd ever do with. Um, we will be seeing them lots in statistics and figure out why they're actually really useful for um, data analysis. All right, so one of the simplest types of graphs to construct and interpret of a, is a dot plot. The reason that a dot plot is so nice is that it actually displays all of the data. So if we were taking a look at the number of goals scored um, per game by the 2004 U.S. women's soccer team, notice we have a horizontal axis. We label it with the variable name, number of goals scored, and we scale the axis. We also have a numerical label, and we put a dot above above each location on the horizontal axis that corresponds to the data value. So it's very easy for us to see that, hey, there were um, zero goals scored in one game, six goals scored in another, but mostly was between one and three goals. So it's a very easy for us to see, and um, I can take a look at each individual data point, which is kind of nice, and not necessarily all of the other graphs do that. Okay, so what I'd like you guys to do is just take a minute, take a look at some frozen pizzas, um, and make a dot plot of this data. So go ahead and pause the recording. Once you've made your dot plot, um, hit play and take a look at the next slide. All right, so the question is, when you did this, number one, did you remember your numerical labels? So you'll get points taken off if you don't have that on there on the AP exam and in this course. Did you label the um, horizontal axis as sodium? And did you make sure you have each of your individual dots um, on your graph? So labels, people forget labels, especially the numerical ones. All right, so why why would we make a dot plot? So dot plots, why would we choose to make that over a histogram, a box and whisker plot, or a stem plot? Number one, it's much less abstract. Well, what does that mean? That means it's very concrete. I can see all the data points, and it's very easy to read. It's really easy to see the distribution of values. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, curves and what that looks like. So this is really easy to see that there's a lot of rattlesnakes and green cobras, not so many anacondas, and over here black uh, cobras and pythons, and they're about in the middle. And we can see each individual data. 
What's the purpose of making all these graphs? The purpose is to exactly see what the distribution looks like. So not just a bunch of numbers in a table that doesn't really do anything with the data. We want to specifically see how the data is distributed um, among the variables that we're looking at. All right, so what exactly does it mean to examine the distribution of a quantitative variable? When you look at a graph, you want to say, hey, what, what do I see? What is this graph telling me? Number one, you want to look for the general overall pattern. What does my graph look like? Where is most of my data clustered on? And are there any major departures from that pattern? Is there something that's really crazy and kind of out there that doesn't really fit with the rest of the data? And you would actually then try to think of, okay, well, why? Why is that data point so far away from everything else? When we describe the overall pattern of a distribution, we're going to use something called socks. All right, it's easy to remember. We want to look at the shape of the graph. Are there any outliers? Anything that's really far away? What is the center of the distribution? So the mean or median and the spread. So how far apart is the data spread? Now, please keep in mind that individual values that fall outside the overall all pattern are called outliers. So they're your guys that are crazy, you know, so far away that they just don't fit with the rest of the data. So if we're taking a look at goals scored, maybe 15 goals, that would be an outlier. The other team must have been really bad. So with outliers, you kind of want to think what would cause that point to be so far away from everything else. Okay, this is just don't forget your socks. You go to school, don't forget your socks, especially when it's cold out. It's an easy way to remember how to describe the distribution. All right, now, when the directions say describe the distribution, you have to think to yourself, what does that mean? So any time directions state describe the distribution, you have to know to do socks. Spread, center, outliers, and shape. Okay, I usually think of a shape, outlier, center, spread. Even though it's not explicitly stated in the directions, you must know to do socks. So let's take a look. Um, this is the same table from our last section. This takes a look at the cars and the miles per gallon. We made a nice dot plot of my data, all right? And when this said describe the distribution, it won't necessarily describe, say, shape, center, spread, and outliers, you'll have to know that that's what that means. Okay, take a look at this guy down here. He's 14. He could potentially be an outlier. Maybe he's some gas guzzling, I don't know, he's got an RV he's pulling behind him or something. But you want to think of why that would be so far away from everything else. So what does it mean to describe the shape? All right, we're looking at whether or not the shape is symmetrical or skewed. Okay, so does it skewed means there's a lot of data to the left or a lot of data to the right. So a distribution is roughly symmetric if the left and right sides are approximately mirror images of each other. So if you could fold the graph in half, that would mean that it's symmetric. So this is a symmetric graph down here. If I fold this in half, a about the left side is about similar to the right side. Don't ever just say symmetric because nothing's going to be perfect. A distribution that's skewed to the right is if the right hand side of the graph, okay, so if there is a right hand side of the graph has the larger value. So here's how I think of skewed to the right. This one is skewed to the right because all of the data is clustered on the left, but the tail is wagging sort of on the right-hand side. So if I was going to draw a nice curve over this, there'd be a tail over here. It's skewed to the left if there's the lower values are sort of dragging the graph down. So if I was going to draw a nice little curve here, there'd be a nice tail on the left-hand side. So think of a dog wagging its tail on the left-hand side, then that graph is skewed towards the left, which means there's a lot more higher values, not very many low left values skewed to the left. Here, this is skewed to the right. There's a lot of low values skewed to the right. So I just think of it in terms of a tail, which way is your tail wagging? To the right, to the left. Surprised I didn't mess that up. I have trouble with my left and right. Okay, so let's take a look at 
Um, what if it doesn't look like any of those normal three? So what if it's not roughly symmetric, skewed right, or skewed left? So if something is unimodal, what that means is it has a single peak. This is what you'll see most of the time is a nice symmetric unimodal graph. So think about if you were to roll a hundred die and you added up the sums of the die. So um, this would be the sum is two, the sum is three, the sum is four. Most of the sums are going to be between um, five and eight. Okay, if I folded that down in the middle, um, that would be symmetric on both sides, unimodal, one peak. Bimodal just means there's two clear peaks. Trimodal would be three clear peaks. Um, there's more, if there's more than two, we usually call it multimodal. All right, so this graph, just take a look at the old faithful geyser in Yellowstone, I think, and the time between um, its eruptions. So in this case, we sort of have a peak right here and then a peak up here. This is not symmetric because if I fold this in half, it's not going to be the same on both sides. This graph down here is uniform. This would be where all of the bars are the same height. So maybe just think about rolling a single die a hundred times. If you roll it a hundred times, you should get the same amount of ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes. Okay, and this graph is symmetric because if you fold it in half, you would get the same on both sides. Okay, next thing, so that is the shape. The next thing that you're gonna do is describe the center. But make sure when you're describing it, you state the center of the distribution is, all right? Now, remember when we talk about a roughly symmetric graph, nothing in the real world is going to be perfectly symmetric. So always make sure to state roughly symmetric. The center is going to be talking about where exactly is the middle of my graph, okay? In this case, the mean and median are going to be in the middle of the graph, sort of where that peak is, and they're going to be about the same. For graphs that are right and left skewed, we're going to use the median to measure the center, and we're going to explore that a little bit more in the next section and explain why. Okay, so if you look here, um, the measure of center is going to be right about here. The mean and median will be the same. Uh, the median will be your measure of center, and it's going to kind of be more where most of the data is clustered. All right, so spread and outliers, we're going to learn a little bit more about this in later sections, but we just want to get a general idea of what the spread looks like. So spread is taking a look at how spread out or how varied the data is. So if we take a look at the sums of the rolls of a dice, they vary from 2 to 12. Okay, so our spread is the rolls of the dice, the sum vary from 2 to 12. Outliers, we're going to formally define this in a later section. There's a mathematical calculation to find an outlier, but for now we're just looking for anything that's outside that data range. So if we look here, um, if we're looking at household sizes, um, if we take a look at 15 and 26, eh, there's, that's um, some outliers. So they probably either have a lot of kids or they have some family members living with them. So just remember, when it says describe the distribution, you know to do socks. The other thing is to do in context. So don't just say the shape of the graph is. Well, specifically, what are we looking at? So the shape of the distribution, notice how I have the use word distribution for household size in South Africa is skewed to the right. I got a long right tail wagon down here. There appear to be two outliers, that's my O, at 15 and 26 people, notice in context. C, the midpoint of the number of people living in the households in context is about six people. So kind of look at where your data is clustered and sort of look at the center of that. The household size for South Africa varies from three to 26 people. Notice, so it's sort of my range from three to 26 in context describing. All right, now when we're asked to compare distributions, that's actually usually what's most important is not just looking at a single distribution, but comparing them. When you compare distributions, same thing. Still do your socks, all right? Still do the shape, the center, the spread, and the outliers whenever you compare the distributions. When you compare the distributions, you're going to make sure you use socks, and the next thing is, is to please make sure you put it in context. So go ahead, pause the recording, take a minute, and check your answers. Okay, now it is imperative that when you compare data that you don't 
do it separately. You must have a linking sentence between the two. You need to use comparative language such as greater than or less than or about the same same as. You will not get credit on the AP exam if you don't use comparative language. So let's just go over two of these. Notice how this we're talking about the shape of the distribution of household size for UK is symmetric and unimodal while, there's that linking word, the distribution for South Africa is skewed to the right. Take a look at the center. Household sizes for South Africa tended to be larger than those for the UK students. The midpoints are six and four people respectively. Take a minute, look at the language between the two, and come back for the next video for the rest.